Welcome back to Elden Ring The Ultimate Guide. Today it is part 26. We're doing Mount Gelmir Upper. If this is the first time you've watched any of these guides, we recommend you watch the video linked in the description. If you've got any tips of your own, stick them in the tips, comment so other people can look over them for extra tips. But otherwise, we're starting at that bonfire that is at the rope bridge and we are heading into um, the upper part of Gelmir, grabbing that arteria leaf, grabbing the blood rose, and there's a couple of other small items floating about in this kind of active war zone, I guess. I don't really know what else you'd call it. Now, we're not going to be fighting those fucking things because um, they don't drop anything relevant. And they're also a pain in the ass. So, fuck that. <laughs> I think the first thing we'll be fighting down here, aside from these couple of dogs, will be the second invasion by Anastasia the Tarnished Eater. Uh, demo and wild strikes for the first time here. It just puts a wall of defense in front of you. Yeah, yeah. So remember to put wild strikes on your great stars because we're going to be getting uh, invaded. Now, this I think is the first example um, that we're going to be given for how good wild strikes is against NPCs specifically. It is without a doubt the best way of killing NPCs in the entire game. Uh, obviously, you need to put it on a big enough weapon. But with the Great Stars, Wild Strikes is just, um, it's just auto-death for fucking Anastasia. She'll just keep trying to attack you so you can walk towards her and just wall of damage her until she dies. Yeah. It's fantastic. Yeah. I've got the Sacred Butcher and Knife there. Um, funnily enough, not actually Sacred, picking up a, uh, Stone Sword Key and Golden Vow, the incantation from the hut that Anastasia spawns in. But cool. the Sacred Butcher and Knife isn't actually a sacred weapon. It's something to do with the way it's programmed, says it has a sacred infusion, even though it doesn't. So oh, really? all you've gotta I... do to Yeah, all you've gotta do to get rid of that tag, it's just called the Butchering Knife. Oh all you've gotta do to get rid of that tag is uh go to a grace and put any other infusion on it. And then when you take it back off, it will just be called the Butchering Knife. I I did not know that. Interesting. Yeah. Weird esoteric Elden Ring knowledge. <laughs> that is that's really esoteric. I just assumed that's what the thing was fucking called. <laughs> cool, I guess. All right, we're at this mask. Shame the Pick weapon's bad, rinse. by the way, because because the lore of the weapon that I just told you is really fun, but mm. the weapon itself isn't very good. Uh, so I can't quite remember what the next thing is we're going to be doing. I think we are is patches next. And then, well, first of all, this little sort of uh, siege tower thing, and then patches, I guess. Yeah, well, we'll be getting another element of the build that we use pretty much for the rest of the game inside the siege tower. Do we? Yeah. Yeah. What's at what the tippy is top that? of the siege tower? Oh, it's the pulley bow. Hey, there we go. Hey. <laughs> Uh, pulley bow, very good. Somber bow, so by that it upgrades using somber stones, which means it's not going to be taking up our uh, non-somber stones that we desperately need. But it also has, I think, the lowest requirements for any bow, but it actually does really solid damage. So, like, yeah, uh, basically everybody can use this bow regardless of what build you're using. And um, it's also pretty much no effort to upgrade. So it's, 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 it's kind of broken, actually. It's really fucking good. Uh, so this guy here being a Lindell foot soldier. Um, we have went over those drops before, but... Uh, aye, so fucking... Hold on. There, there be the pulley bow. Yeah, as you've said, fantastic weapon. Um, just has really respectable base damage. Um, comes with mighty shot, which is very useful. Uh, yeah, all in all, great. It's just a direct upgrade to the longbow for our build. So, just, I guess, to... So, actually, we'll talk, we'll talk about Patches first. Patches is here, by the way, so he's actually kind of hard to find. Um, and as Patches does, he's going to lead you into a little trap. But this is just how he progresses his quest, so you got to... Like, you just... You just got to let it happen, sadly. Uh, do your best to not bash his head in afterwards. But when you go, when you go to the edge of that cliff there, I did cut the... The, um, the loading screen and stuff out. But when you go to the edge of the cliff, patches will boot you down it. And for whatever reason, you can't immediately warp back until you, like, touch a grace. So you can just run in here, grab this grace, or indeed any... The, you just run straight to the end and grab that grace or whatever. But as soon as you're here, um, 
apparently we're yeah, I wasn't doing anything there. But yeah, now we can warp back to uh, the... So this is the... The Lusat, like the Lusat guy, yeah? I think it's Lusat. Uh, as a... It was, okay, it's... Uh, so it's basically, it's the, uh, the... The grace at the end of the lower portion of Gelmir, but it's actually just a... Uh, I, I mean, you could go back to the grace before the siege tower. It kind of just doesn't really matter, but... Um, I just wanted to pick that one because I was wanting to show you that you can, in fact, jump from uh, Azure's grace back over here. So, now you'll speak to Patches and uh, exhaust the dialogue. There you go. You don't actually need to do this interaction at all. Um, if you don't do it, you miss out on the class, uh, the classic Patches kicking you down a hole um interaction but you don't need to do this if you just progress onto the volcano manor and started to progress the volcano manor um quest line patches would just appear there skipping this interaction entirely so i have spoken about the drops of the lindell guys but the lindell foot soldiers which are the ones that look kind of i guess cheap i suppose they could just they can drop their armor set that being the gilded foot soldier cap the leather draped tabard and then they can drop shit weapons like dagger short sword short spears and soldiers crossbow the Lindell soldiers can drop their armor set and whatever weapon it is that they're wielding. So obviously the helm, surcoat, gauntlets, greaves. Uh, now for this particular um, this particular hero's grave that we're going into is actually a little bit, for, in my experience, a little bit harder than uh, the other ones proportionally. Uh, I don't know why, I, I struggled against it quite a bit. Um, so make sure you've got Sacred Blade on one of your katanas or at least any other weapon, because uh, there is a bunch of skeletons in here, particularly on the first part of this area. The skeletons are a bit annoying. Now, I'm specifically putting on the Royal Remains set because um, I'm a little bitch, because I kept dying in this fucking grace. The amount of time that we must have done like five or six takes just with this one area to get the footage right, because I kept dying. Um, so I was taking no risks, and that's why I put the Royal Remains set on, which is a set that will start healing you slowly once you're below 20% HP. So you will always be at 20% HP if you wait long enough using this armor set. Uh, obviously having the Sacred Blade uh, to kill the skeletons, but we're just running down to this cubby hole with the bow skeleton first, first of all, and uh, Sacred Blade him so he doesn't respawn. Uh, and As with the... Wait. I was about to say, as with the hero's grave in uh, Limgrave, this is one of the chariot graves. It's much, much more tricky to navigate than, say, the hero's grave we did in the last part of Altus, because there are no chariots in that one. It's way easier to manage when there aren't any chariots, but as with the Limgrave one, you just want to watch where it's going, watch its pattern, and dip in and out of these little cubbies to avoid getting hit by it. Uh, just to reiterate, the skeletons in here can drop the... Uh, the so the, Okay, actually, I guess we'll talk about this first of all. Actually, this is way more important. So, we're bringing out the Prelate's Hammer. And uh, this is just one way that you can navigate through the lava. You don't even need to meet the requirements for the hammer. As long as you have it, you can do it. And um, what you can do is use the Prelate's Charge Ash of War in the lava. And uh, this is a, a fantastic way of just blasting through the lava. Um, obviously, uh, apparently you've not taken the Physic Flask, so... Now, be very careful here, uh, because that is a, a drop-down hole. And it drops you in front of one of the um, Cemetery Shade enemies. And it can just, as soon as you drop down and you're in that kind of landing animation, it'll just blast you with a bunch of attacks and just bleed you out immediately. So... Be very careful that you don't drop down that hole. The cool thing is the lava doesn't do too much damage to you, and for your efforts you get the ringed finger, which is, I don't even know what fucking class of weapon that is. So the ring finger is a regular hammer, similar to a mace or a club, something like that. But it has a unique ash of war called claw flick that does a surprisingly huge amount of stance damage, um, does a very respectable amount of dual damage and can knock over smaller enemies. It's actually not bad at all, despite... It's another one kind of similar to the boys, where it looks like a meme, but it's actually not bad at all. So there you go, there's an interesting thing you do, the prelate's hammer. Um, and now we're putting the... Uh, 
putting the grey stars back on. Yeah, this room coming up can be a bit of a pain in the ass because there's a few pages in here. Um, one's going to ambush you immediately. There he is. Um, these enemies, as we've said in several parts, can be quite tough. They're generally tougher than other things that you will find in the same area as you find them. So... Uh, particularly given, their, given the fact that they just look like normal NPC-sized enemies, they are way tougher than they like visually look. Uh, they deal quite a bit of damage, and they've got quite a lot of health, and they attack quite quickly. It's just really odd. I mean, look how much damage we're actually doing. It's really not a lot. But they can drop their entire armor set, so that's the hood, the garb, the trousers, and... Uh, oh, I guess that's it, the hood, the garb, and the trousers. Uh, and they can also drop the red brand short bow, despite the fact that they never use a short bow, and they don't drop their crossbow or their, like, rapier-type weapon. So, now you know. Uh, in, in here, is just a bunch of different, like, wandering noble enemies. Um, the ones with a hat that we just killed there, they can drop the hat and their, like, armor set. And they can also drop the uh, Noble Rapier, I think. Uh, the Noble Zestock. Noble Zestock, thanks. For, thanks. Uh, the Skeletons can drop the... Oh, God, it's really annoying that I can't find it in this list. Scimitar, Human ah. Bone Shards, Longbow, go. um, Gross Messer. Yeah, so uh... the Gross Messer is the big... Um, is like the big curved sword. And obviously the Scimitar is the smaller one. Now, at this room, you're, there's two pages in here, and again, they can be quite tough if you're getting ganged up on. Uh, so what we're trying to do is just bait one out at a time. Or try and, like, mark one very, very quickly, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, this is a problem that Ground Slam can solve, but it's also a problem you can solve by re-raising the fire trap and having the path for the second one to get to you cut off with the big plume of flames. Yeah. Now, I, this is um, the kind of situation where, in fact, Lion's Claw would be much better than Ground Slam. Um, so, we have recommended before, you will have Lion's Claw in your uh, Ash of War repertoire, so putting, putting Lion's Claw on uh, rather than Ground Slam. In situations like this, yeah, it's probably going to be better. Yeah, we've said, we said way back when, when we were in the Mistwood in Limgrave, the ground slam is good versus groups um or anything that you want to keep stunned by keeping it flattened where lion's claw is great for breaking poise and it's good versus single targets rather than groups it does also this flatten in, in the same way as uh as ground slam. it does yeah it does um just not against large groups you can't really flatten multiple enemies at once yeah yeah um this interaction here is quite an odd one because there's seemingly no way to dodge this this chariot yeah. stick of damage. If anybody knows how to do this without the um, was it knight's feathers, raven's feathers? It's the raptor of the mists. Asher. Right. Yeah. So if you have the raptor of the mists, basically instead of getting hit by this thing, you'll kind of teleport above it and it will go past you. But otherwise, I do not know how to do this without raptor of the mists. Yeah, so absolutely gold star. Like, getting a well-done scratch and sniff sticker in the comments if you can tell us a method of getting past that without using Raptor of the Mist. Yeah. Um, almost certainly there's, like, something on the roof that you can actually just shoot and destroy it. I fucking bet, but, yeah. Uh, so, we're waiting for this thing to pass, and then here is where the cemetery shade is. Now, again, Lion's Claw would be better for this because it comes out faster. Um, but you want to be very, very careful. And we have to kill that one because that's the only one in the game that drops the Mantis Blade, which is the weapon it uses itself. So now we're dropping down here, and this is where we're about to get two armor sets for whatever fucking reason. Yeah, two armor sets in one room. There are so many Bloodhound Knights scattered throughout the game, and they gave this one the armor set. Yeah. When there's odd. already an armor set in the room, it just doesn't make any sense. Just spread things out. This game's massive. And there's no armor sets to be fucking found in this game, basically, so... <laughs> yeah. And for God's sake, if you put enough of them around, you could have had one Bloodhound Knight drop one piece of its armor in several different locations. So you yeah, find it yeah. throughout the course of the game. Strictly speaking, I do think that, again, Lion's Claw would be better for this guy because it has slightly better tracking and it comes out faster. And you can't... The good thing about Lion's Claw as well is you... 
as much as you basically can't be knocked out of Ground Slam, some things can knock you out of it. You just can't be knocked out of Lion's Claw, but unless something grabs you. So, yeah, it's, Lion's Claw is really fucking good. But we now can put on the, um, the Gelmer Knight armor, because that is now the best armor set that we have, pretty much across the board. Although the, the jar head is still better than the Gelmer Knight head, so that's kind of cool. It's a very drippy armor set as well, the Gelmer Knight, and the Bloodhound Knight's armor. Um, is very cool looking as well. So yeah, two yeah, actually yeah, really aesthetically pleasing armor sets here. So now we have to do a bit of a, a tough uh, drop. You have to time this correctly. So type, look at look at when we drop, and then drop at that point. Uh, I think you want to drop as soon as it like comes in, but we'll see. So as soon as it stops moving, that's when you drop. And this takes you all the way to the bottom, which uh, you can actually access a slightly different way as well. Um, there is a set of drops you can do that will drop you down onto this platform that we're on now. Um, from yeah, like at up. the start, from the from the starting bit, uh, there's like a kind of bit that you can drop down. Um, like the kind of but, the first the first lava run slide thing with the chariot, you can drop down the side. There's like a kind of gap that you'll have noticed. But now it's time for the boss, and I again cannot remember what this boss is. Oh, this is the this wolf. Red wolf. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the mistake I made in the last episode. This one is the red wolf. Um, so it's what not... we are doing is we are immediate. We're just dying to it because uh, if we just if we just die then um, we will stake with Marika right outside and then we'll have our flasks and stuff. I will say, don't do this if you are using great runes and rune arcs, because dying will cost you your rune arc. You obviously don't get that back when you die, and so you won't have your great rune effect anymore. That is a very good point, yeah. So if you are rune arced, this isn't recommended. But as we don't use rune arcs at all during this playthrough, because there's no guarantee that you'll even have a rune arc, this way it's definitely, you can definitely replicate how strong we are um, at any given point in the game. But by all means, use a rune arc if you want to. It will make things even easier. But as usual, we're taking our physic flask, we're putting on golden bow, and then we are summoning the mimic tier with both the bonks. And um, this guy is annoying because he does move about a lot. Uh, again, Lion's Claw would be better than uh, Ground Slam. But the jumping L1s are so fucking good. And because we get to just go, haha, proc, bleed, haha, proc, frost, haha, do a big load of poise damage, as long as you can get your hits in, you're not going to have a problem. And there you go. We got Bloodhound Knight, Bloodhound Knight Flow, which gives us our own Blood, Bloodhound, uh, Bloodhound Knight that we can summon. Obviously, the Mimic Tier's better, but still pretty cool. Yeah. It is cool that you get to summon one, because um, it's rare that they ever give you the ability to summon a boss type enemy. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that is neat. It's just a shame. The the Bloodhound Knight summons kind of squishy. It doesn't have as much health as you'd think it would. So, we're going back to the top of Mount Gelmir, going back over to Patches, and then there's another rocky bit that we get to run over. Uh, I guess whilst I'm here, I'll, I did talk about the Lindell Foot Soldiers, but the Lindell Soldiers, which are the ones... Uh, well, first of all, that's Mad Pumpkin Head. Those things can drop the uh, Chain Link Flail or the Pumpkin Head. That's cool. And Lindell soldiers can drop their armor set, so the the helm, the surcoat, the gauntlets, the greaves, and then they can drop the Lord Sworn straight sword, the war pick, heavy crossbow, and the Lord Sworn shield, which is the great shield, and uh, the brass shield. Now, just there, we picked up the scavenger's curved sword, and that is the best, well, one of the best curved curved sword weapons in the game. Now, what we're going to do here is a cool little trick. You can just immediately head up these stairs, and then you'll notice that the Grafted Scion is back up here if we quit out and load back in. Go down a little bit on the on the ladder, and it'll just jump straight to his death. So that's just kind of cool. More esoteric Elden Ring knowledge there. Yeah, um, yeah. I think the reason that happens is because after it does its jump attack and it hits the wall, the game considers it having landed. So the rest of the fall, it takes fall damage. But here is the Gelmia merchant who sells the Confessor's starting gear, as well as a cookbook, and infinite 
um, exploding bolts for crossbows, which is, you know, kind of a nice thing if you're using the the three round burst pulley crossbow. You can get some pretty respectable damage out of the exploding bolts, but uh, nothing really to write home about. It's not something we ever really take advantage of. So I would like you to say thank you in the comments for me speeding up the ladder footage. I'm going to guess other much uh, much bigger guides uh, probably didn't do that. <laughs> not that you're bitter or anything. <laughs> nah, not that bitter or anything. So yeah, so we've got some more uh, Lindell foot soldiers, soldiers and knights. Uh, the Lindell knights obviously being pretty strong and they can drop the, the knight helm, armor, gauntlets, greaves, the knight's great sword if they're using it, the partisan if they're using it, the great bow if they're using it, and the golden great shield if they're using it. And there you go. So, if you are on this guide looking for a way of defeating the fucking... Um, fallen star beast that is up there on that spirit spring then oh boy do we have the method this is the method for beating fallen star beasts and again as we've said we probably recommend that if you are struggling against the fallen star beast in Otto's plateau well now you should have everything and once we've done this next little cave we're going to come back to it and then fallen star beasts will never be a problem ever again the enemies in this cave are demi-humans of all varieties. Do you have their drops to hand? Uh, I'm just getting that now. Yes, so right. they can drop the falchion. If, so the weapons that they're using, that being the falchion, the club, the spike club, the great knife, the bloodstained dagger, the rickety shield, and then they can drop string, glass shards, rune fragments, rainbow stones, glowstones, volcanic stones. Lovely. Yeah, there's all different types in here. There's the very small ones, there's demi-human chiefs, and the boss, if you couldn't guess already, is a demi-human queen. Um, so that one down there is the lesser demi-human chief, and that's the thing that drops the bloodstained dagger. And as you can see, this big boy's club. got the spiked club. Yeah, most of the little ones have the falchion. Uh, the very little ones are carrying the great knife, etc., etc. You'll you'll come to learn what they drop because you kill so many of them per playthrough that you're bound to get some of the drops eventually. Yeah. Um. So we go down. The great knife and the bloodstained dagger are actually um, both very good weapons. The bloodstained dagger has very good strength scaling, so it's not a bad option for a strength dagger. Um, and the great knife is excellent with blood infusions. Um, so, worth keeping in mind if you're looking for something to pair with, say, the Reduvia, if you wanted to power stance. So, this, like, rooms like this are a great example of where Ground Slam is, like, better than Lion's Claw. But, it's kind of 6 of 1, you know. So, we got the Coil Shield there. That is a very interesting, unique shield where it's Ash of War sends out a big snake head that, um... Can inflict poison. It actually has like a really respectable amount of poison buildup that can poison a lot of things in just one hit or two. For the most part it'll be two max um, but a lot of things it will just poison in one hit so yeah the coiled shield is actually like really surprisingly decent because it does at the surface you're just going to dismiss it as another gimmicky shield but actually it's, it's pretty cool. I mean, not just the the buildup of the poison, it also deals deadly poison, which is shorter lasting but does more damage more quickly, as well as the fact that the attack it has, which inflicts the poison, will uh, it has very respectable range. It can stagger enemies because it seems to hit really hard, and it also does respectable damage. It's just not a bad option all round. So here we go, we've got another demi-human queen, this one's uh, apparently named, but you know what, we are so unbelievably geared towards like pushing this thing shit in that it just doesn't matter. Like there, there isn't a strategy, just hit it, like you're never going to lose to this thing. It's so squishy, it can be frosted, it can be bled, it can, then it can die. We have four great stars bro, like look we're still in full health, <laughs> but for that we get the jar cannon. <laughs> The Jar Cannon, again, a, a not a bad weapon at all. Doesn't have much in the way of scaling, but if you meet its base stats, you can slap any kind of Great Bolt in there, and it does very respectable damage. So, apparently, we are coming here, because we are going to get... What are we going to get? I believe Black Flame Blade. Sure. So, this is the optional part of killing 
the um, the Fallen Star Beast. This is just a way of getting in like guaranteed damage, quote unquote. But the main part for killing the uh, the Fallen Star Beast is the fact that you can get the Mimic tier to essentially exclusively kill the Fallen Star Beast. So we've got the Katana on with Black Flame Blade. We've got the Icon Shield. We've got the Coiled Shield. We're wearing we are wearing the uh, Royal Remains armor set. And the only spells we have active are Black Flame Blade and Rotten Breath. So what we can effectively do is force the Mimic tier into exclusively using Rot Breath and nothing else. So if we have the um, if we have the Icon Shield, it is the Icon Shield, right? Yeah, that's correct. So we've got the Icon Shield in the left hand, and then we have the Seal in the right hand. That means the only thing that the Mimic tier can do is use Rot Breath. It's forced into doing that. Now, Rot Breath actually does a bunch of tick damage as well as inflicting Rot. So it's not like it only inflicts Rot and doesn't do damage. So you just have the Mimic tier just blasting out a giant cone of damage in front of it. And then what we're effectively doing is just being like auxiliary damage. Uh, we could just stay the fuck away from the Fallen Star Beast. We don't need to really concentrate on it at all. Uh, we just get our hits in when we get them in, right? But we're using... We've switched to the Coil Shield just to kind of show what it does. Because um, it is cool. But you will see that eventually the Mimic tier will be putting in fantastic work against this thing. So, Bang, as you saw one there... one hit, deadly poison. Yep. Look at that. Now, something else to bear in mind is we're wearing the Blessed... The Blessed Do Talisman, we have got the Icon Shield, and we have the Royal Remains Armor Set. Which means that the Mimic tier is actually regening an amount of health. Which effectively means that the Mimic tier is nigh unkillable. Yeah, because I mean, any any damage it takes, it can regen. Um, and if it doesn't want to take damage, it can block with a Great Shield. So... It it has options that mean it just stays alive for so long, and it's just pumping out constant Scarlet Rot build up, constant chip damage with the Rotten Breath. It's this strategy took how long did it take us to figure this out? About three hours of workshopping different strategies against this thing. Yeah, and this was by and far the absolute best strategy. Now. Uh, what are we doing? Well, we have the katana on with double slash, and then we have also got black flame blade. Now, black flame blade lasts a very short time, but it does cast in a very short time to make up for it. So that means that we can effectively run towards the fallen star beast, cast black flame blade, and then use double slash because that's a really fast attack in Ash of War to just get in a bunch of damage. Because black flame blade does like an amount of guaranteed chip damage. So it's really, really powerful in that sense. So if you can hit something with it, it doesn't matter what the defense is. It's going to do that much damage to it, you know? So again, that bit is like completely uh, sort of like irrelevant. The main thing ultimately is the fact that we can get the Mimic tier to just constantly spam Rot Breath. And this becomes a super strong strategy that we can just utilize throughout the game for many, many bosses. But this is by far the best thing that we can do. Um, now, to me, that looked like it was super easy. But even then, you still saw that the Fallen Star Beast still has a ton of health, a ton of defense, still puts out a ton of damage. It is absolutely disproportionately difficult for this part of the game, by a huge margin, actually. But we can get the Mimic tier to fight it for us. So very, very cool. And I'm very, very proud of this particular strategy. Because, yeah, it's like you can kind of bang your head against the Fallen Star Beast. You can deal damage to it. You can hit it with your weapon. If you heal enough and, you, you know, you're sloppy enough, sure, you can kill it. But this just feels like a really elegant solution to me. All right, okay, so we did lie slightly. There is another extremely, extremely even easier version of fighting the Fallen Star Beast, and it is as such. So when you jump up the Spirit Spring, you want to go right on the edge of the crater. As far as that way, when you land, the Fallen Star Beast does, doesn't immediately aggro. And obviously, if you do aggro, you can just jump back down and try it again. But what you want to do is you want to sneak around the outside of the crater. Somehow, the Fallen Star Beast 
doesn't aggro on you. Yeah, it has to see you before it will start aggroing. But you can indeed poison this thing to death, right? It is incredibly reliable, and it will get the job done, and everybody can do it. But dear God, it is excruciatingly boring. Which is why we're not showcasing it as the main method of killing this thing. It's especially boring when you compare it to the rot turret. Like, sure, the rot turret's riskier than this. I mean, this is very consistent. It's going to work every time. But the rot turret's also just fun. It's fun to be able to set the mimic up in such a way that it basically kills the boss for you instead of you having to sit here and wait for 20 minutes while this thing finally croaks. Yeah, so this is the thing, like, you'll be here about... Like, look how much fucking health this thing is. You'll be, you'll be you'll probably be here about 10 to 15 minutes waiting for this thing to actually die. But the cool thing is, is the reason I want to show off the rot turret is because it's a technique that you can actually apply to other bosses that you might, have, might be having trouble with. Um, you know, you can always just set the mimic tier up to be the rot turret and just have it go to town. It's actually it's really, really good against Estelle. In fact, we actually use the rot turret technique against Estelle because of how good it is. Uh, so yeah, it's like something you can actually take throughout the rest of the game. Whereas this technique, you can't really do it. But now something to mention is you have to stay behind it crouched and you have to use poison mist. You can't move, you can't do fucking anything. Uh, and if you use rot breath on it behind it, it's if it takes any damage that isn't from like a poison tick, it'll just get aggroed. It's not only an elegant solution, but it's one that uses all the tools in the tool belt. We yeah, have and enough kind of... faith to be able to use Black Flame Blade. We can force the Mimic to use Rotten Breath that we have access to. We're using an armor set we haven't used before. We're using an incantation we haven't used before. We're using Ashes of War that we've rarely used. You know, it's, it's a really good showcase of... Elden Ring is a game where you have the ability to solve any problem the game presents you with by swapping your gear and trying things out. It All really right. is encouraging experimentation to to the highest degree. Now, interestingly enough, the Fallen Star Beast is actually still... Despite the fact that we've changed our weapons to the Great Stars, it's still effective against them because it can't be bled and it can't be frostbitten. Uh, which is just very interesting. Uh, but as you can see, we went into the Volcano Manor there, we grabbed the Grace, and then we switched our gear back. Now we also have a dagger with Storm Stomp on because we're about to kill a Scarab. And these invisible ones, uh, you really want to have Storm Stomp, effect, essentially. That's that's the way to do it. Now, that guy that we just killed there is a marionette soldier. They can drop the marionette helm, the marionette armor, spiked spear, crossbows... Uh, sorry, the Spiked Spear, the Short Bow, and Cuckoo Glintstones, which it did drop there. Now all you need to do is line yourself up with where this uh, Scarab is going, and bang! There we go. We get through that... and through for that. Through and through is pretty much pointless. It's mighty shot for the Great Bows. Um, there there's only one infusible Great Bow, um, and it comes with through and through as standard. So, <laughs> right, okay. Really, ultimately pointless. And if you are going to use a great bow, by the way, just use the lion great bow that you get from Radan's Remembrance. It is just better. So, you did notice that we uh, walked past one of the golden trees. We've already been here because Raya teleported us here uh, earlier in the game. So, we've already gotten the map piece and we've already gotten the golden seed because we picked it up while we were here. But, now we grab this grace that's onto the bridge. And we're going to be heading down to another worm face enemy. Um, thankfully, we've got the the uh, the great stars now, which is pretty good against the worm faces and com like compared to the uh, the katanas. But we're still going to put on Lord of Death's postule because, frankly, just getting death blighted off these things is a gigantic pain in the ass. So we're taking no risks, and we're going to just. Uh, because, so we need to kill this one. Normally we'd just run past these things, but this one drops a larval tier, if I remember correctly. Yeah, you are remembering correctly. That is exact drops. But the cool thing is... Well, I, that, you can see, Great Star's making short work of it. Yeah, it was it's very, very easy to break this thing's poise with three jump attacks. So, aye, pretty great. But fuck me, the grab attacks for these things are so irritating. 
fun like, animation. The, the animation, it, I mean, sure, but the animation lasts forever, and fucking, it's got such a huge grab box, and it's, oh, it's, I fucking hate these things, and then it wastes your time by spitting out a giant fucking cloud of death, so you need to just wait about until you can hit it. Fucking hate these things, man. But for our efforts, yeah. we get a larval tier, so cool. Guess we had to do if that. If you need a lav, yeah, I mean, if you need a larval tier, by all means, come here and kill this. But there are seventeen others scattered about in the game world, so just uh, yeah, get any of the others because that means you don't have to fight a worm face. Uh, also, Lion's Claw would have been much better at fighting that thing, just to make a point. If you had Lion's Claw on Spam Lion's Claw, that would be a better way of doing it, which is the way we do do it when we get to um, Farm Azula. So, strictly speaking, don't use the jump attacks, just stick Lion's Claw on and spam it at that fucking thing. But okay, now we are fighting an illustrated tree spirit. You did notice that we came here, we went back, it was a weird thing with the footage, but ultimately, all it was was um, went back to the Grace and Healed. So, I mean, look, par for the course with Alterated Tree Spirits, you know what we're dealing with at this point. Stick on, you know, stick on your your flask, stick on Golden fl Flow, Flowden Glow, um, and then summon the Mimic and just start spamming uh, jumping L1s at this thing. There you go, easy peasy. If you want, yeah, these you can also be put on... easier than they've ever been. Yeah, so other things that you can do is... Um, Put on uh, Blood Flame Blade. Uh, you could also do Blood Flame Blade Wild Strikes. That would also be great against these things. Um, we just couldn't be arsed showing a situation like this because it's just it's not necessary. Just doing this is enough. But you could also put on Flaming Strike. That would be doing a huge amount of damage to these things. So at this point, there's like so many great options. Yeah, it's like I was saying moments ago. Like, at this point, we have so many tools in the tool belt. Um, we're almost at the point now where it's basically dealer's choice. Yeah. We've shown yeah. you a lot of very, very viable strategies, especially against enemies that are now being repeated. Um, so, just want to make a point, so... we picked up a Golden Rune 4 there. Note where we are picking up these items, because they're kind of hard to see, because they're kind of in a bunch of debris. So, we picked up a Golden Rune 4. There was a Drawstring Fire Grease. And then there's some golden arrows around here. I mean, I guess these items are kind of irrelevant, right? But, strictly speaking, they're kind of hard. They're, they're, it took me ages to find them, so I just wanted to kind of point that out. Now, continue. <laughs> All right. Uh, I don't know that I should, because at this point, it looks like you're about to start progressing Celibus's quest. <laughs> sure, yes. Yeah, we are. So, back to Rani's Rise. Now, time to do a little bit of Celibus. At least I think it is. Um, it's either Celibus or Selen. And it looks like it's got to be Selen. It's Selen. Okay. I mean, still, that's important to talk about. So, at Rani's Rise, um, you're going to be heading for this ruin. And there is a illusory flaw? Question mark? Um, and down yeah, here is basically Celibus' creepy dungeon where he has a bunch of life body doubles of people. And Selen is behind a hidden wall in a room with a bed. So make of that what you will. But if you'll recall in a previous part, we took Selen's Primal Glintstone. We've come now to put it in a new body so that she can escape the prison that she was being kept in, the Witchbane Ruins. And now she's going to mount a one-woman assault on Ray Lucaria, which <coughs> I believe is where we're heading now. Uh -huh. um, and from here, so from Renala, Queen of the Full Moon, the Sight of Grace, that is, uh, you can go outside and pick one of two summon signs. You can either pick Jeren and fight Selen, or you can pick Selen and fight Jeren. Uh, we pick Selen because the reward you get is ultimately better. Um, you literally don't get anything for picking for Jeren. Like that, I'm, I'm as far as I'm aware. If you do the Jeren side of things, this you literally just don't get anything more for doing it. But I think um, it's an ancient dragon smithing stone. I, th I think it is that, but we get enough of them, and strictly speaking, um, the the equipment is more valuable. So as you can see, this is the greatest example of how great Wild Strikes is. This is this is it for every NPC now. No NPC will ever give you an issue. I mean, yeah, that was just free. Yep. Um, when you respawn, you'll get the eccentric set. That's the armor that Jaren was wearing. And Selen has replaced Renala, 
um, except no, she hasn't. Ronal is just hidden behind a bookshelf over to the right. You finish this dialogue um, where she wants you to become Elden Lord. You get the Chris uh, the Glintstone Chris, which is an exceptional weapon for an intelligence build. Its Ash of War hits stupidly hard. She also now sells Shard Spiral, which again hits exceptionally hard. So if you're doing an intelligence build, this is where you want to come. You fast travel back here. Renala mercs Selen on the spot, turns her into a big ball. You get the crown. Selen is still the sorcery merchant. She still sells her stuff. But now she's just in pain while she does it. And that is officially the end of Selen's quest. Yay. Happy ending? Uh, question mark. <laughs> <laughs> Ending the misery. Um, <laughs> so now that we've done Selen's quest, we can head back here and get Azur's set. And then I think we also head again back to fucking Celia, hide out, and then we get, um, not Azur, but the other one. Lusat. Thank you. Lusat set. Um, How anybody very... would... Go on. No, go on. No, but how go. anybody would ever think about coming back to either of those areas? Like, <laughs> particularly this one, because you have to come here for Selen's quest. I just don't know, like, it's just so, you'd never do this in natural progression of the game, but whatever. If I had to speculate on how people figured this out, they went back to Azur and saw that his armor set was here and remembered that they had to do that for Selen. So I came here to check if uh, Lusat's armor was here. Yeah, I guess. I guess. I certainly didn't figure that out. Not on my first playthrough. I didn't know this armor <laughs> set existed. I didn't know half of Selen's quest existed. Yeah, yeah, me neither. Yeah, fuck you, Glintstone Sorcerer. Um, right, cool. There's Lusat's armor set. And now I cannot remember what the next part is. Oh, Garank. So I think at this point you should be pissed off at us. Yes. So, um, so Garank is angry, right? He very well might be too difficult for you to actually. You don't need to defeat him. You just need to do an amount of damage to him. Now, something I noticed is that you can actually summon the mimic tier here, so that might actually be a shout. Um, if you're able to get it off fast enough and then reheal back up, the mimic tier would probably be quite helpful here. But, you only need to do an amount of damage to him. So, if you're able to just... Probably, honestly, Lion's Claw, best bet here. Because he won't be able to knock you out of Lion's Claw. Um, so, you can just kind of get your guaranteed damage and Do a Lion's Claw heal, do a Lion's Claw heal. And that's probably the best, th the best thing that you could do here, actually. Because uh, Lion's Claw will do good damage as well. But, as you can see, you only need to do, like, pfft, not even 10% of his total HP in order to get him to shut the fuck up. So it is doable, and even if you die, you can just come back here and re-pick up your souls. So, you know, no harm, no foul. Yeah, I mean, you literally respawn in the same room as him. Um... So, rest at the grace, and then he'll go, he'll go back, and then you can start giving him uh, the uh, the death route again. So at this Which point, I believe we're doing... Two. Yeah. yeah, we picked a couple up. One of them was in the Gelmir Heroes grave, and I can't remember where we got the the second to last one. I can't remember either, but we obviously did do it. So, uh, so we got Stone of Grank, and we got I uh, can't remember what the other one was, but uh, Stone of Grank. It was irrelevant, uh, is what it was, because Stone of Grank's actually really good. It's basically long distance poise breaking for uh, for a faith build. It's very good well worth using boosted by the claw mark seal as well if you were casting with that but we've come here to hug to upgrade the pulley bow because this now replaces the long bow for us yeah yeah i mean the long bow the long bow served as well i actually think the pulley bow has longer range than the long bow as well so it's it's just, just kind of crazy i think it has the highest range of any of the bows it does but the, yeah, lowest, you're right. but the lowest requirements it's crazy it just it's, I don't it think doesn't it, make any i don't sense. think it's the lowest requirement I, don't I think, think it's right. It has very low requirements, but I'm I'm almost certain it's not the lowest. Surely to God. So we are upgrading our Ashes of War. Uh, upgrade your weapons if you can. I don't think we had the stuff to do it, but if you do, cool. Uh, and now we are just uh, leveling up with excess. I'm 
Pretty sure I guess that must be it for Mount Gelmir. Pretty fun area, lots of lots of good items. So definitely worthwhile doing everything here. I think we're just putting the build shit back on. So yeah, stick the golden scar back on. But as you can see, that is the build for the end of this episode. There's our stats, hopefully you're close to that. But otherwise, that's it. And okay, there we go, that's Mount Gelmir. Done. Join us in part 27, where we're going to be doing Volcano Manor. Now, other than liking and subscribing, you can follow us on Twitter. You can also follow us on Twitch, where we will be streaming once the DLC is out. And if you're feeling especially generous, you can sling us some cash on Patreon if you're so inclined. But the best thing you can do is just comment anything. Just comment anything. Go on. Anything. Two seconds. Go on. Anyway, catch you in the next part.